my charity event on Thursday or who are coming to support us. It's at the Deco, uh, when the good folk from Barclay Card are going to be tripping the light fantastic in Strictly Barclay Card. Her tickets are still available from the Deco. If you wish to see a fabulous show, that's what will be going on there this Thursday evening. Uh, just Google Deco Northampton and that will give you access to tickets. Without their help, says Cathy, we wouldn't have raised over £15,000 so far for the NCTLC Cancer Charity for Children. It's amazing, amazing work you do. This Thursday evening at the Deco. Now, he's from Northamptonshire. He's uh, selling his book across the world online, but obviously it's important for him to sell it in his own county. His book is about his life in the UK prison service. Almost 20 years he spent there. It's called Behind the Fence. Paul Goss, nice to see you, my friend. Thank you for coming in. Nice to meet you, Bernie. You've seen death on a number of occasions. You've been scared. You've been deeply affected. Unfortunately, yeah. You've seen the oddities. You've seen perversions. With that in mind, mm. with the benefit of hindsight, why did you want to go into that game in the first place? I don't know. What, to be honest, I saw the job advertised in the Sun newspaper, and I'd done nothing like it before. I wasn't in the services, um, and I just decided to apply. Um, I was looking for another job at the time, and... The scariest part of it was, I think, the first time I'd, I'd, you have to do like two weeks in a, in a local prison to sort of go just dressed in a suit, walk into the place, there'll be no keys, they'll take you around, they'll show you about just to see if you can handle it or not. And you had to keep waiting, and it was just abuse after abuse from prisoners, trying to put you off, trying to scare you. And if you got through that two weeks, then you pretty much knew you'd be okay, yeah. But um, How many didn't? What percentage don't do it? I think the first time I turned up to interview, I think there should have been four, and one turned up. Um, which was me, and then well, I had to go to interviews in the London, a few of the London prisons, Wilmot Scrubs, Pentonville, okay. and each time there should have been at least four or five people, there was like one or two, and I think out of all the people from all the different interviews I was supposed to go to, I think I was the only one I ever saw that actually went through. Is a prison a, a prison in terms of the response uh, from prisoners, uh, or are some more rough than others? The Victorian ones always look for bogey, yeah, don't they? It's, it's more, yeah, about the conditions of what's inside. I mean, obviously, the rules changed a lot over the years, and they had to put internal sanitation into all the prisons and stuff like that. But, yeah, it is. It, a lot of it depends on, on whereabouts it is, yep. uh, what the facilities are. But it, yep. it, the worst part is the staff in these days. They've just reduced the staff so much that you just can't give a full regime each day or, <laughs> you know, and it's... Prison day starts at eight. Ish, yeah, around there, half seven, eight. OK, where do they go for breakfast? They all have to leave the cells? No, uh, it sort of changed over the years. When I mean, I'll say I started in 91, so they used to come down and, and get, like, a breakfast from the servery, but these, the, with cutbacks and everything else, they now give them, like, a, a bag of cereal and a, and a carton of long-life milk, so they'll just get up in the morning and eat their own breakfast in the cell. So, OK, so it's a pack, they anywhere. get a breakfast just, pack, yeah, like a pack. And then they can decide whether they want to eat it or not, yeah, can they? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, and then they work. Every prisoner has to work, don't they? Every adult prisoner is supposed to work, yeah. But the the, the facilities aren't, you know, good enough to or big enough to be able to give everybody work. So there's always those that will not work. But if they don't actively seek employment within the prison, then they'll get like an unemployment pay. But then that will reduce and reduce and reduce to the point where they get nothing yeah. if they don't get out of their bed and go and try and find a job. And when they, what you call uh, Smiths, in the yeah. book, uh, are working. What do you, what you call Joneses? Mm. Because you can't give names in the book. No, it was easier not to. Yeah. So uh, what do the Joneses do while the Smiths are working? Um, all sorts of different duties. There's a lot of searching to do. You know, in the morning, the cells have to be searched. Areas of the prison have Every to be day. searched. Yeah, daily, yeah. Um, every cell has to be checked for, like, locks, bolts and bars, we call it. Like the fabric of the cell, checking windows, bars, you know, doors. Um... There's different things, like uh, uh, you, you can patrol the, the workshops to make sure that people are behaving themselves around the place. Yeah. Um, afternoons there's visits, so you'd man the visits hall. Yeah. Um, various different things. Explain to me, and uh, a lot of people like me who don't get it because we haven't been inside the system, so we don't know how it works, how you get drugs to be so rife in prison. Oh, it's there, there's lots of different routes, and without going into too much of a detail, a lot of people, the, the visitors will bring it in through visits, but somewhere where we can't touch it so internally they'll bring it in and then they'll try and pass it on the, in the visits hall and then it will be then hidden again internally and sometimes obviously again because the amount of people staff that you have and the amount of visitors you just can't see it all they have cctv but you can never spot it all and then they're traded in the yard aren't they they're, tra they're all over the prison yeah okay. but a majority of it comes over the fence now it's still literally they'll throw it over in i'm talking probably 20 30 thousand pounds at a time it's a massive business within the system now and there aren't the staff to patrol that then? You yeah. just, you can't be everywhere at the same time. I mean, when I first started the job back in, uh, it was, a, mind you, it was a Category A prison, so there's a lot more staff then uh, in Albany on the Isle of Wight. It was, um, 
we had 13, 14, 15 officers uh, on the on the wing. You'd also have a, a senior officer. There'd be a principal officer, which is the next thing. You'd have your own wing governor. So he, you know, so there was a lot of people there. And when I left um, Wellingborough, there was maybe two, three members of staff to unlock 60, 70 prisoners. Okay. And then one of them had disappeared to go and do a job. And so you're just stuck with two staff trying to patrol all of that. Yeah. And then obviously with stuff coming over fences and that, if you're busy there and there's staff just doing their jobs, there's never anyone to go and deal with an incident. You know, you, you could turn up at a fight or a, an assault and you have to have a minimum three members of staff to, to control a prisoner, one on each arm, one on the head, and it's all done professionally. But sometimes you turn up and you're the only one there or maybe one other member of staff and you shouldn't even get involved, but you had to and put yourself at risk by doing so just to try and sort out problems. Yeah. Some of the stories in this book are, are, are very dark. There are some lighter ones. Yep. Um, complaints every day about the food. Oh, every food's day. a big issue. It didn't matter what you gave them. Yeah, they, had, they had five or six choices for lunch, five or six choices for evening meal, and you could guarantee that whatever they chose, when it turned up at the hot plate, they'd see something that looked better, and they'd say, no, I didn't choose that. Okay. And, yeah, they have, they, I think it was just a, an unwritten rule that you complain about everything. Who cooks it? Who serves it? Um, there's there's uh, staff there, like um, chefs, and then a lot of the prisoners. A lot of the prisoners will be trained or will work in that area within, within the kitchen and be paid to work in there. Black bits in your peas? Unidentified black bits? Oh, there's always black bits in the peas. Yeah, I don't know where they get them from. It, I'm sure they just scrape around the floor. If there was no black bits in the peas, it wouldn't look right. No, it <laughs> had a bit of texture, yeah. didn't it? And they had to set it as well. It was always served, the peas were served in slices. <laughs> it, was, it never moved. It was, it was great stuff. You could just cut it into slices. And the bad food goes to the nonces. Now, explain who these are in prison terms. It's, yeah. Because I thought that nonces were child abusers. It can be. Yeah, it's, it's a general, it's a generalised term. It's not a nice term, and I don't, you know, it's not something that I would use myself, but I've used it obviously in the book because that's the way they talk. That's the, that's the way that things are said within the prison. Um, but it, it's just generally, it could be a whole range of people with sex offenders. It could be rapists. It could be it, um, anyone who's, who's run for cover. Like if you was in there and you were recognised or so you'd had a fight with somebody else in another prison and you turned up at this place and someone was there that knew who you was, then you'd be abused or, or attacked every day. So, so they they're like the second a... strata then, in, in, in many yeah, ways. Yeah, so it, they... it was mainly, it was, it's, a, it's a term that, that is more about sex offenders and rapists yeah. and stuff yeah. like that, yeah. And they would get the bad stuff? They'd, well, yeah, it was like an unwritten rule that if a prisoner, had a nor, you know, would call a normal prisoner, had the chance to attack a, a, you know, a sex offender, then they would. They just saw it as their duty, and it, that, was, that was something that you had to try and stop. You know, years ago, the, the, the prisoners would um, sign a thing called Rule 43, and that's like protection, so they'd be in a wing where it was full of people of that, of that particular type. And they could never be taken anywhere where there'd be other prisoners. You know, they had to be segregated away from the mainstream prison. And it was increasingly hard to sort of... Because there's, there's that many more of them coming into the system as well. How have you seen prison change inmates over the years? Um, it's talk... changed out of recognition almost. But the prisoners, how do you see them change in their time there? You talk of guys who uh, like a fight who could go on a wing full of bravado. Mm. Do they remain like that, or does the system crush it out of them? It, the system itself isn't probably the major drama. It's, it's the prisoners within it that, that cause more problems for the other prisoners. I mean, staff, the staff, you know, we do the job as best we can, and we treat everyone with respect unless we're given a reason not to. You know, and I would try and be the best I could with anybody. I'd always help people out. So there's always bad people everywhere you go. Some of the staff I met over the years I probably didn't have a lot of time for, but that's the way they like to do things. You know, everyone's different. But it's the prisoners, really, that cause the other prisoners more problems, you know. And, and the worst part of it, Bernie, is, is the amount of drugs that have got into the system. I mean, years ago when I first started, there might have been a bit of cannabis. Um, and people smoke that, and they... they chilled out and laid back, but it stays in the system for 30 days. Whereas now, with the, with the drug testing, the mandatory drug testing that goes on, you know, test the urine testing, um, a prisoner would rather, if they get caught with, with any drugs in the system, then they'll lose days. You know, they'll have to serve a bit more of the sentence. So now they've turned to heroin, which stays in the system 48 hours, supposedly. So they don't get caught as often. But now the heroin's caused its own problems by where everyone's getting addicted, everyone's overdosing on it, everyone's stabbing each other to try and get more. And just, it's, it's the, the viciousness of the attacks. The violence is stunning mm. uh, in your book. Self-harming is very, is very common. Yeah. Uh, is it a cry for help? In some cases, and no one likes to ever term it as that, because obviously everyone's got a reason that, you know, that they do the self-harm. And I've tried my best over the years to understand it, and I don't think I still do. Although some, said, you know, some of the, the, there's some reasonable guys, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of really decent people in there that, that perhaps need a help or a hand to try and find, you know, direction of where they want to go, what they have to get out of this constant spiral that they're in. Um, 
And usually, with a little bit of help, some of them do make a difference, you know, but the self-harmers used to say it, it, it takes the pain away, you know, it, but just by giving themselves a bit of pain, cutting a wrist, but a lot of them were very light cuts, but it made them feel better. Not all light cuts. Not One guy was Zippy. Them. You called him Zippy. Zippy, he was famous in the, yeah, in the system down where we were, yeah, he, he had such a severe thing across his stomach, he, it was just, he had like a, a rubber skin over the top to hold it all together. And he could literally just open that up. I, was, I went to a hospital a bed watch one day with another prisoner and saw an officer sitting outside his a door. So what are you doing? He's, he was from Parkhurst. He said, oh, Zip is in there. I said, oh, well, I've never seen him. He said, go in. As soon as I opened the door, the smell <laughs> was just immense. No wonder he was sitting outside. Yeah, it was, it was a strange character, that one. There's one fella who, uh, I've got to be careful how graphic we go. Of course, he isn't quite graphic. In there's places, yeah. uh, a guy who got a toothbrush. Yeah. And he had shaved it down to a point, and then he got a number of razor blades. Mm -hmm. And then he had rammed this mm -hmm. tool so it looks effectively like a, a metal toilet brush, and it with all yeah. these blades yeah. coming out. And he'd rammed that several times mm -hmm. up his bottom. Mm -hmm. Did he that survive? Was in the yeah, that was in the first six months of me doing the job. I found that was the guy that found him. Now, it? how do you recover from that? Because, you know, he's, he's in extraordinary pain, he's done it himself, mm. there's blood everywhere, he's awash, he had to go to hospital immediately, and yeah. you know, you're not going to recover from that overnight, are you? I think, if I remember rightly, I mean, that was, that was back in the, you know, in the day where it used to happen on such a regular occasion that you just almost became immune to it, you yeah. saw it so often. Is that the problem, that it anaesthetises people? You do, and, and prison officers have a, a very strange twisted sometimes mentality or, or sense of humour and we'd laugh at things or and, you know that nobody else would understand why but because you have to otherwise you go mad exactly and I, on occasions I did I went I became you know, I suffered with a lot of stress in the later years and depression and because I let it affect me rather than just laughing it off but years ago when we say that was in the first six months so sort of 1991 we would have gone through that, would have dealt with it, would have gone up to the local club, had a couple of pints, sort of taken the mickey out of each other, and, you know, oh, you did this, you did that, or you got punched by this guy, and it was... And you'd go home, having had a laugh and a talk, and you'd chat out with your friends, and that would have been it, because we all lived quite close to the prison back then, when I lived on the Isle of Wight. But the, because there isn't that amount of staff anymore, you, you know, you don't tend to see... You, you know, your workmates that often on nights out, you don't get together and sort of talk about the things. And so you didn't have that way of offloading it. It was just like you'd go home with it and you try and obviously you don't want to burden your wives or your, your, your husbands and tell them all the depressing things that happened. So it just started sticking inside your head and you couldn't sort of get rid of it in any way. It's a really good book. Enjoyed it. Yeah, I really did enjoy oh, it. Yeah, and you published it yourself, haven't you? I did self-publish it, yeah, sort of on, onto Amazon. Good so. for you. Yeah, I, I did ask for it. I tried a couple of publishers here and there. If there's anybody that's listening that wants to do it, great. But it was... Um, it it's was, tough, isn't it? It is. It's very tough. And I think I didn't realise quite... Uh, writing the book was hard at the time, but now it's, it's, I've realised that's the easy bit. It's trying to get people to know where the book is and that it's out there. I can tell them. It's called Behind the Fence by Paul Goss, G O S. You can get it on Amazon. If you buy a hard copy, it's six ninety nine. You can yeah, download it's, it. Can't yeah, it's as a kind, yeah, onto a Kindle or Kindle app. It's, I think it's £3 odd. Very good. Thank you for coming in. Nice to meet you. Thanks so much.